Hello again. This is V. Anton Sprawl talking about how you can learn to think like a programmer. In this episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about recursion. There's a chapter in my book about this topic, and the cool thing is that you can download and read it for free by going to my publisher's website. If I've set this up correctly in YouTube, you should be able to see the link in the video right now, and it should also be below the video on the YouTube page. In this video, I'm going to be explaining the concept in a slightly different way and using an example not in the book. So I would recommend watching this video first, reading the chapter from the website, and then trying a few programs on your own to apply the ideas. Real quick, just to make sure we're on the same page, what is recursion? It's when a function or some other subprogram calls itself. Most of the time, this means direct recursion. That's when a call to a function occurs in that same function. It can also refer to indirect recursion, where two or more functions call each other in a loop, but that's quite rare and we won't be discussing that kind here. Here's the thing about recursion. Depending on the area of programming you're working with, you can go a long, long time without needing to do any recursion. So why did I put a chapter about recursion in my book about problem solving? I did it because so many of the students I've had over the years have really struggled with recursive programming. And by that, I mean with recursive problem solving. There are a few people who come into this world as natural recursive thinkers, but for the rest of us, it's a skill that has to be learned, and it's a different way of thinking than what we're used to, even different from other types of programming. So most people have a very hard time with it. But when I showed students the technique that I'm about to show you, they were able to do it. So that's why I like this topic, because it shows that the right technique and the right approach makes all the difference. There is a methodology to solving problems using recursion. And if you use that methodology, you can go from someone who is frustrated by recursion to someone who can tackle any recursive problem. And building that kind of confidence will help you no matter what kind of problem solving you're doing in the future. Okay, so what is the proper technique for solving a recursive programming problem? In the book, I call it the big recursive idea. And I don't actually reveal it until about halfway through the chapter. So I guess we should say that this is a spoiler alert. But the big recursive idea is to avoid thinking about recursion at all. In most books that explain recursion, you'll see a lot of diagrams that look something like this for functions that linearly process arrays or lists, or maybe something like this if they're processing a binary tree. And the implication is that you should be thinking about all the recursive calls that will be spawned in the course of processing a particular set of data figuring out how those calls are going to fit together to produce the desired result. And at some point, yes, it would be great to think about recursion that way. But that doesn't help you solve recursive problems at all. To solve a recursive problem, the last thing you should think about is an elaborate diagram of function calls, or what's happening on the system stack with all the activation records, or anything like that. Let me give you an example of the three-step process I show in the chapter. I should say that to actually do all these three steps, you have to start with a problem that you already know how to solve without using recursion. But once you get good at this technique, you can use the concept without explicitly following all the steps to derive a recursive solution to any problem. So here's the problem we're going to try to solve recursively. We've got two integer arrays of the same length, representing sensor data. The second sensor is intended to be redundant, so in fact the two arrays should have identical values. But for practical reasons, there are going to be small differences. So the function we're writing is computing the total absolute differences in the values. So for example, if sensor A uh, sub 3 is 10 and sensor B sub 3 is 14, that's a difference of 4. And it doesn't matter which value is higher than the other. It's the absolute difference that we need. 
So we're summing the total absolute differences among the values in the same locations in the arrays. Here we go. Step one, write an iterative, that is non-recursive, function to solve the problem. You'll see exactly why we need to do this in the next step, but it also helps us get straight all the issues in the problem that have nothing to do with recursion. Among other things, it helps us get the parameter list correct. I can't say how many times I've seen students go off in the wrong direction on the parameter list in a recursive problem. The simple rule is, your parameter list will most likely look exactly the same whether you are writing the function recursively or iteratively. In this problem, we'll have three parameters, the two arrays and a third parameter indicating the size of the arrays. The function will return the sum. My function for this step looks like this. The ABS function in C++ returns the absolute value of its argument. As you can see, there's nothing exceptional about this code, but if you're still fairly new to C++ programming, you might want to pause here and make sure that everything's clear. And you can see I've got simple test code in the main function. Step two, write a second function that I call a dispatcher. It does two things. First, it solves the problem for some minimal data set. It's not always clear what the minimal data set is, but in this case, it's going to be when the size parameter is zero. You can't get a data set smaller than an empty data set. So if there's no sensor data, we can just say that the total difference in the sensor values is zero. The second thing the function has to do is call the first function to handle situations where the data set is not minimal. The trick is, the dispatcher is required to give the iterative function a smaller data set than it was given. Since the size of our data set is specified by the size parameter, we will effectively reduce the size of the data set by subtracting one from that parameter in the call to the iterative function. This means we have to handle the last value in the array in the dispatcher function. So let's compute the difference of the last values in the arrays like this, and then add this result to the value returned by the iterative function. So if our original size parameter was five, meaning in C++ values from location zero to location four, the iterative function would compute the differences from locations zero through three, then the dispatcher function would compute the difference at location four in each array, and those values together would cover the entire original array. And as you can see, I've changed the test code to call the dispatcher rather than the iterative function. You'll notice that to this point, we have not thought in recursive terms at all. We have not made any recursive calls, we haven't even used the word recursion. This is the big recursive idea in action, because now we are ready for step three. In step three, in our dispatcher, we replace the call to the iterative function with a call to the dispatcher. At this point, we can get rid of the iterative function altogether. So now we have a recursive solution to the original problem. As in the previous version, the function works by either handling the minimal data set or handling one small piece of the data set and then making a call that solves the problem for the reduced data set, putting those results together to make the correct result for the entire data set. This is the key. We don't have to think about the fact that our function call is a recursive call if we don't want to. We can just assume that the call we're making will return the correct result for the arguments it is given, and then figure out a way to solve the entire problem based on that result. If you give this idea a try, start as I did with a problem that you already know how to solve without using recursion, so that you can explicitly go through the three steps I've shown. Once you've done this a few times, you'll find that you can apply the technique without actually going through all three steps.
just by trusting the result of the recursive call. At that point, you can use this technique on problems that cannot easily be solved iteratively, which really are the problems you should be using recursion for anyway. As I stated at the beginning of this episode, the recursion chapter is available at my publisher's website, so go check it out if you want a complete explanation of what I'm saying here. I hope this helps you out, and as always, thanks for listening. Please do subscribe or hit the like button if you'd like to see more videos like this, and let me know if you have any suggestions for future episodes. Thanks.